Well, good morning, everybody. Hey, good morning. Well, uh, throughout its history, uh, Fort Worth has seen its, uh, of course, fair share of uh, notorious individuals, of course, in sensational trials. Uh, uh, one such trial you might have heard of is the trial of uh, J. Frank Norris, the Texas Cyclone. You ever heard of him? He was a, a controversial fundamentalist preacher who railed against communism, evolution, Hell's half acre. He had, went through uh, numerous uh, legal issues. In uh, 1912, he was accused of uh, setting fire to uh, his church and house. And a few years later, he was accused of shooting a uh, lumber company executive named D.A. Uh, Chip. Uh, he was tried in that case in Austin and on the grounds of self-defense. And of course, the other high-profile trial, probably the Godzilla of high-profile trials here in, Fort, in uh, Fort Worth, was probably Colin Davis. Yes, Colin Davis. Who, I mean, I'm a child of the 70s. I remember Colin Davis. So uh, he was accused of uh, killing a couple of people in his mansion, Colin Davis mansion, which is just off Hewland Street. And of course, there was a huge trial on that. And uh, there was also another trial of him where he was accused of uh, hiring a hitman. So, but, uh, but there was another famous trial. I don't think a lot of people are aware of it. Uh, there was one in the 1950s that was just as sensational as those two. And that was the murder trial of this lady here. This is uh, Mary Clark. She was accused of hiring uh, three, well I was going to say three gentlemen, three thugs, of uh, hiring these three individuals of uh, murdering her husband. So anyway, uh, I want to start off with a uh, little background. Uh, Fort Worth, this is uh, Fort Worth uh, in the 1950s, and uh, this was a really important decade for the city because this was a period where Fort Worth had a lot of growth, a tremendous growth. In fact, by the end of this decade, Fort Worth had a population of 350,000 people. We were also a major manufacturing center. We had like 40 manufacturing plants in Fort Worth at that time, 65 transportation companies also during that period. We were also very, um, had a very influential oil business there in Fort Worth. Uh, actually, there were like 30 oil companies uh, in the city during that decade. So a lot of guys were making a lot of money in oil, and one of the gentlemen that was making a killing was this gentleman here. This is William P. Clark, uh, native of, uh, well, Oklahoma. It was actually called Indian Territory at that time. Uh, he was born in that area in 1892. Came to Texas and decided to get into oil business and did very, very well. So his... Uh, Financially, he was doing great. Personal life, eh, not so good. He went through a couple of marriages, both of them ended in divorce. So financially, he was doing great. His personal life, not so great. Anyway, now in 1946, he decided, hey, you know what? I'm a rich guy. I deserve a really nice house. So he decided to get this place. This is Westbrook House, a Tudor Revival uh, house built in 1928. It's located at 2232 Winston Terrence West in the Park Hill neighborhood, just south of Fort Worth, not too far from the Fort Worth Library. Uh, it was designed by uh, Joseph Pilek, who was a very well-known architect at that time, designed a lot of buildings in Fort Worth. It was uh, built for a gentleman named uh, Roy Westbrook, who, uh, like Mr. Clark, was also in the oil business, did quite well. He was actually, he ran the Westbrook Oil Company that discovered, by the way, the Hendrick Field, which was probably one of the most important fields in the Premium Basement area. He also owned the old Fort Worth Cats baseball team. So he was a very influential guy in Fort Worth. And like Mr. Clark, he was doing quite well uh, financially. Personal life, not so good. He married uh, five different women, two of them twice. So he's been down the aisle a few times. So <laughs> anyway, so, but Mr. Clark liked his house. And he bought it for the amazing low price of $60,000 at that time. So, yep. Now, this house, of course, is going to play a very, very important part in the story. Now, I mentioned that he went through a couple of uh, marriages, Mr. Clark, but not, he didn't stay single for long because this is where Mary Clark comes into the picture. Uh, she's originally from uh, Euless, Texas. Uh, like Mr. Clark, she also went to, a, of course, a couple of marriages. Um, her first marriage was to the executive of a box company in Fort Worth. They were married for about, I think, about nine years. Uh, her, the first husband uh, died, of a, died of a heart attack. She married a second gentleman who was an engineer for the Texas Electric Service Company, but uh, they divorced in 1951. Now, in 1950, uh, Mary 
Mary Bates was working uh, in a downtown investment office, and that's where she met Mr. Clark. Uh, she was helping him on investment matters, so they had a business relationship, and that business relationship turned into a romantic relationship. So, uh, just before she divorced her second husband, on February 13th, 1951, after just a month after her divorce, sorry, uh, she married uh, William, Mar William Clark, so she became Mary Clark. So, hey, maybe it's the third time to charm for both these folks, but no, not, not, not quite. So, anyway, oh, wait a minute, let me get back here. Because before they got married, um, William Clark asked Mary Clark, are you seeing anybody? Are you intimate with anybody? Mary says, no, I'm not. No, you're it. You're the one. So, but after they got married, uh, Mr. Clark came across some information that, well, she was. She was cheating on him. Not only that, she was going around town telling uh, people that my husband, this guy's a sapping an old fool. So he's bad-mouthing him in Fort Worth. Well, Mr. Clark, of course, was not happy about this. So on December 23rd, 1952, he files an annulment. And but basically accused her of saying, hey, she didn't marry me because she liked me. She married me because of my money. So, but uh, Mr. Clark went beyond that. He changes his will, and in the will, she only gets $10. $10. This guy's worth three quarters of a million bucks. She gets 10 smackers. That's about it. So anyway, she wasn't happy about that. Uh, on his will, he also changed it where most of it would go to uh, various charities like a boys ranch in New Mexico in Amarillo, uh, a crippled children's home, and also the boys town in Nebraska, you know the one of Farnham for Landigan thing? The money was going to go to that. So not only that, uh, the court ruled, he goes to court, and uh, the court ruled that she had to leave the house. But Mary says, no, I'm not leaving, I'm staying right here. No, despite the fact that it's William Clark's house, he's the one that bought it. But Mary says, I'm not going anywhere. Well, she got, uh, he was, she was held to contempt of court over that. At the same time, the judge ordered William Clark to pay her $300 per month, pending, of course, the outcome of the uh, divorce hearing. So how much you like to get between these two guys here? So anyway, so, so it looks like it's going to be a really nasty fight between these two folks, but... Of course, that will change dramatically because in May 22nd, 1953, by the way, this is the Park Hill neighborhood, and that's the house right there. Of course, the zoo is right over here. Neighbors in the Park Hill neighborhood uh, noticed that they saw Mr. Clark's car parked right here and had been there for a few days. Not only that, they uh, discovered that a bunch of newspapers were piling up in his front yard. So they thought this was a little suspicious. So they called the authorities, and uh, three gentlemen uh, showed up. Uh, one of them was a justice of the peace named uh, Dick Galloway, and a couple of detectives from Fort Worth. They arrive at the house to investigate, to see what's going on. They manage to get in the house, and they're looking around the place. And one of them goes to the uh, bedroom here. One of them goes into the bedroom, and they find Mr. Clark's body lying on the, uh, lying on the floor. They find a uh, 25 caliber slug embedded, of course, in the carpet. They checked his pockets. They found like a, a prescription bottle and a few pennies in it. Now, Clark was known for wearing diamond rings on his fingers, but they didn't find any rings on, on his fingers there. Uh, and he was also known to carry a large sum of money on, on his person, but they didn't find any money there. So initially, they thought this was a uh, robbery that, that went south, that went wrong. But... Uh, Mr. Um, Mr. Calloway, uh, Dick Calloway, the Justice of the Peace, thought, well, maybe not. Maybe it was a suicide because he was going through a very, very nasty divorce. So he thought maybe he killed himself. Well, um, no, not this guy. His brother, this is Philip Clark, William Clark's brother. He didn't buy the suicide theory. He says, there is no way that my brother would commit suicide for a number of reasons. First of all, there was no suicide note. There was no powder burns uh, on his body. Not only that, 
But the, um, let me show you, the rifle that was used to uh, kill Mr. Clark was placed on this chair over here, and of course his body was about a few feet, uh, six feet away, so there was no way he would have killed himself and then put the rifle on the chair. I mean, that's just, <laughs> that's, that was just not going to work. Um, not only that, the medical examiner ruled that uh, the bullet severed his spinal cord, and his body would immediately collapse there, so that kind of it would have been impossible for him to kill himself, collapse on the floor, and then put the rifle on the chair. So, uh, yeah, Mr. Calloway was dead wrong on that. Um, another problem with the suicide theory was, of course, was the use of a rifle. He was a firearms expert. He, uh, why use a rifle when he had a, a, a pistol available for him? So, not only that, there were no prints found on the rifle. So, it was officially classified as a murder. And that it was determined that he was actually murdered on May 19th. Remember, they found his body a few days later. So, uh, Mr. Clark, sorry, Mr. Clark uh, was desperate to find out uh, who killed his brother. So, on July 26, 1953, he places an ad in the Fort Worth Star Telegram saying he would personally pay $1,000 to anybody who could uh, provide information that would lead to the arrest and conviction of his murder. Now, Mr. Clark's, uh, Mrs. Mary Clark's attorney uh, claimed that because of the death of, of her husband, the strange husband, that the annulment suit was over. It's finished. It was, it was dead. So therefore, she gets everything. You know, whole enchilada. Well, uh, Mr. Philip Clark, the brother, says, uh-uh, no. I, he, the marriage was a sham, first of all. The marriage was a sham. You didn't marry my brother because you loved him for his money. So he files suit to uh, stop this. And so we have now a legal tug-of-war between, of course, Mary Clark, who looks really, really happy after marrying her, of course, husband, and, of course, the stern-looking guy. This is Philip Clark. So anyway, uh, so... But the murder of Mr. Clark uh, kind of went cold for a couple of years until this guy comes into the scene. This is Harry Huggins, and the best way to describe Harry Huggins is a career criminal and a thug. This guy, on, uh, 1950, in 1955, goes to Worth Police Station and tells him, Hey, I know something about this murder of uh, William Clark. He claims that Mary Clark offered him and two other guys, $10,000 to, uh, to murder him and make it look like a Robbie gone wrong. Now, let me tell you something about Mr. Huggins here. Uh, he's from Denton, Texas. Like I said, he was a career criminal because he has an extensive uh, criminal history. He served five years for theft, 15 years for murder, 10 years for robbery and theft, and five years for a post office burglary. In fact, I managed to get my hands on uh, th these documents from the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. You can't, uh, of course, tell from here, but I was looking through them. He was not a model prisoner. He's, uh, <laughs> uh, he, he and the guards did not get along very well. He had numerous uh, disciplinary problems with the uh, Texas justice system, especially in Huntsville. Not only that, he, uh, he apparently didn't like being in the state penitentiary because he uh, escaped uh, the penitentiary not once, but twice. So uh, there was one escape actually in 1944, and uh, previously there was, actually, there was actually one in 1941 where he escaped the penitentiary, but he was caught a few days later here at Arnton at the Arnton Heights neighborhood. So anyway, uh, he goes to the police station and he says, hey, I know something about this murder. Now, why did Mr. Huggins come forward after two years? Well, according to the police, Mr. Huggins, according to the police, Mr. Huggins said that, well, his conscience really got to the best of him. And, um, and they'd have been able to sleep for a couple of years, and all of a sudden he said, I think I better, you know, spill the beans on this. So anyway, uh, I mentioned that there were two other people involved here. Uh, one was Larry, uh, a gentleman named Larry Tinsey Eagleston and Cecil Green. So the police were, of course, looking for these two gentlemen. One of them here is uh, Larry Tinsel Eagleston. Um, now, on April 7, 1955, the police, of course, were trying to find Mr. Eagleston here. They found him in the uh, upstairs bedroom 
of an apartment in South Fort Worth. When they arrested him, he was clad in a shorts and it was hanging around with a 21-year-old blonde who was his mistress. He was married, but he's hanging around this 21-year-old. And uh, they also found a 45 caliber uh, pistol in his door. So they find this guy, they arrest him. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Mr. Eagleston here. His real name is Larry Randolph Eagleston. I don't know where the name Tinsel came from, but that's what he, that was his nickname. Uh, he was born in 1906 uh, from Belton, Texas, which is out in central Texas. He was the youngest of four brothers. The family moved to Fort Worth. Of course, he was six years old. His father actually worked at a packing house. I'm assuming maybe the Swift or Armor plant. I'm not sure. Uh, but like Mr. Huggins, he, he was a career criminal. Started his life in crime when he was uh, in 1928 when he was caught burglarizing a cleaning shop. Arrested in 1929 for manufacturing, possession, and transportation of liquor. This was during Prohibition, by the way. In 1934, he decided to up the ante and graduate to violent crime because he got 13 years for armed robbery. And like Mr. Huggins, he didn't like staying in the penitentiary because he also tried to escape from there. He didn't get very far because he was caught two days later. Uh, he was also involved in the shootout with a gambler, but he, of course he was never charged uh, with that. He was also probably involved in narcotics. He was also involved in the incident uh, involving a uh, cricket dice game that led to a fight between him and an insurance agent. But he was never arrested or charged for that. Apparently the guy who he had a fight with went to the DA's office and told him, don't prosecute, I don't want anything to do with this. Apparently he was probably pressured into not, you know, fingering Mr. Eagleston here. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> also, uh, there was an incident uh, back in November 22nd, 1950, because Eagleston was living in Burleson, Texas at that time. And he decided to go into his automobile. And when he went into his automobile, he noticed that the hood of, of his car was cracked open a little bit. He thought that was suspicious. Gets out of the car, uh, lifts the hood, and he finds a jar of nitroglycerin under the hood of his car. It was set up basically, you know, you turn on the ignition, and whoop! <laughs> so somebody was not apparently uh, a big fan of Mr. Eagleston. So, uh, so anyway, he escaped that. But anyway, now the same day that Mr. Eagleston, uh, of course, was arrested, Mary Clark also gets arrested too. And in fact, a reporter asked uh, Mary Clark, what's going on, why are you under arrest? And she says, I don't know what this is all about. I have no idea you know, why, you know, why they're arresting me. So anyway, she looks very happy about this, doesn't she? So uh, now I mentioned the third individual. This is Cecil Green, once again, another career criminal, originally from Plano, uh, grew up in South Dallas. Uh, went through the justice system, of course, several times. He started his life in crime when he was 14 years old because uh, he was sentenced, because uh, he was caught uh, stealing from a uh, state training school. Uh, he, 1931, he was arrested for auto theft. He uh, was actually investigated for numerous crimes in Dallas, Fort Worth, Oklahoma City, Houston, Shreveport, Miami, and Sacramento. Don't forget Sacramento. Uh, he was also, uh, they, the Kansas City authorities actually considered him prime suspect in the robbery of $72,000 worth of furs from a country club there. And uh, he was also the suspect of uh, numerous gambling house uh, robberies in Texas and Oklahoma. So they find him and they arrest him. So now we got four individuals arrested for the murder of William Clark. Now, on April 12th, 1955, all four of them, uh, of course, were indicted uh, for the uh, murder of William Clark, and all of them, of course, made bail. But this case will take, of course, another drastic turn, because May, 20, May 2nd, 1955, Cecil Green and Tinsley Eagleston, out on bail, were out on the Jacksboro Highway here. This is the Jacksboro Highway, of course, not too far from River Oaks area. Uh, Eagleson was driving the car, Cecil was in the passenger seat, they were just driving around there and they decided to stop by a place called the Byway Drive-In there on Jacksboro Highway. They stopped there and at that moment when they stopped there, three car loads of um, three cars came by there and they shoot up the car. So Tinsley Eagleston, uh, he only gets cut cut by the glass from, from all the blasts there. 
but uh, Cecil Green was not so lucky. He, get, he got hit by seven bullets during the ambush. Now, there was a story that what happened was that when they were shooting up the car, Eagleston grabbed Cecil Green and pulled him in front of him uh, during all this. So basically used him as a shield. So, hey, what are friends for, right? So, uh, so anyway, uh, so Eagleston, of course, gets by with just cuts of glass. Of course, Cecil Green was not so lucky. They take him to St. Joseph Hospital where they went through 16 pints of blood trying to save his life. But they didn't succeed, and he dies the next day. So, he, so now, who's responsible for this? Well, there are a few theories out there. One of them was that Mr. Huggins was probably behind the uh, hit on Mr. Green and, uh, suppose, and almost hit Mr. Eagleston there. Uh, another theory is that these two guys, Eagleston and Green, were out strong-arming a bunch of uh, gangsters and hoodlums to contribute to their defense fund for the upcoming trial. They were asking, hey, can you let us a little cash there for our defense? Uh, another theory is that this was about the control of the prostitution ring in Dallas and Fort Worth. So. Now, Eagleston, of course, lucked out on that first hit, but he didn't luck out the next time because on April 26, 1955, somebody uh, tipped off the investigators here in Fort Worth about an abandoned car in uh, North uh, Fort Worth. Uh, this is uh, Main Street. This is uh, Long Avenue right here. There's an old uh, grocery store right there. And I believe they found the car right there. Somebody found an abandoned car. It was a 1952 Ford and Oldsmobile, similar to that one. Uh, well now, when investigators arrived, they, of course, inspected the car, and they found uh, there was blood splattered all over the upholstery and on the floor. They also found a empty 12-gauge shotgun shell and a loaded 9mm Belgian automatic pistol in the, in the visor. The car had, of course, been stripped of its hubcaps, and, and after further investigation, of course, they determined that was Tinsey Eagleston's car. But there was no sign of Mr. Eagleston. Well... A, few, uh, a little bit later, Tarrant County Sheriff's uh, Department, of course, got a tip from somebody who claimed that they heard shots from an area near Saginaw, Texas. So on April 31st, uh, a little bit later, uh, his deputies were looking around the area and found a well. It turns out uh, he was shot three times with buckshot, and his body, of course, as you can see, was clad in, um, clad in, there we are. He was clad in, of course, a shirt and trousers. And they knew it was Tinsey because, uh, because, well, first of all, they found a picture of his wife in his uh, wallet and also a picture of his uh, daughter. And uh, they think he was probably killed in the automobile. Here, let me. He was probably killed in the automobile, and his, of course, body was dumped in the well. So now, who's the behind uh, Eagleson's, uh, Eagleson's murder? Well, of course, again, there are a number of theories. One theory is that, of course, Harry Huggins again. They think that Mr. Huggins probably had something to do with it. Uh, another theory is that, uh, of course, it goes back to where Greeny and Eagleson were trying to strong arm a bunch of guys to contribute to the defense fund. That probably has something to do with this murder. But there's another theory involving this, and this involves this guy here. This is uh, Jose Antonio Ramon Cantera. He was the uh, 16th president of Pamela. He was assassinated uh, at a racetrack in Pamela on January 2nd, 1955. Eagleson was sub reportedly was involved in this guy's murder. He was paid $20,000 for his part in the conspiracy to murder the president of Pamela. Not only that, he was supposed to give $30,000 to two other conspirators for their role in the murder. Well, Tinsley reportedly uh, gambled away his $20,000. But he also gambled away the $30,000 he was supposed to pay these other two guys for their part in a conspiracy. So they think these two guys were, well, apparently, I'm, I'm sure these two guys were not happy. They didn't get their cut. So they probably thought maybe they hired somebody in to take out Mr. Eagleston. So anyway, so now we have uh, two gentlemen involved in this plot uh, dead. Now, before the trial goes forward, this guy comes into the scene. You might recognize this guy. This is Senator Price Daniel. You might remember him you know, from Texas, uh, originally from, uh, of course, around Liberty, Texas. Now, Senator Price Daniel was interested in the narcotics trade here in, um, 
in the United States, specifically in Texas. And uh, he was worried, he was basically, he was uh, targeting uh, trafficking in the state of Texas. He had particularly interesting, of course, all the gangland, kill, gangland killings that was going on in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And he was very interested, of course, particularly in the uh, William Clark trial. So he was holding a bunch of hearings uh, throughout the United States, and he wanted to talk to some of the people involved in the murder, specifically this guy here. Remember Mr. Huggins? So Mr. Huggins gets a subpoena. Price Daniels subpoenas Huggins. Mr. Dank, Senator Daniels uh, has a subcommittee meeting at the U.S. Uh, US courthouse here in Fort Worth. And so Mr. Huggins shows up and Mr. Daniel uh, talked to uh, Harry Huggins and he asked him about, first of all, his drug use. He asked, uh, do you use any drugs? And he says, yeah, I've used morphine and cocaine. Yeah, I have. I don't, I don't deny that. Then he asked him, well, can you name any users who are still alive? And he says, no, I'm not going there. <laughs> no. I put my life in danger if I said anything. Daniels asked Huggins about, of course, um, his involvement in the Clark murder case. And Mr. Huggins says that, hey, I'm under indictment. I'm taking a fifth on that. I'm not going to say anything about that. So Senator Daniels asked him, what does that mean? You're not going to say anything about the trial. He says, no, I'm not. I'm not going to say anything. Mr. Clark, of course, was... Um, still kept on uh, talking to him about the Clark case. He went to ask him, well, did you shoot Mr. Clark? He says, no, I didn't, but that's all I'm going to say. Daniel, Spryce Daniel says, well, can you tell me who did it? He says, I'm not going there. I'm not going to say anything. I'm taking the fifth. So, and that was the end of that. So now we go to the uh, trial, and the trial was scheduled for November 19th, 1955. And days before the trial started, of course, the attorneys from Mary Clark tried to get the thing thrown out. They said that the uh, indictment was way too big, but the judge says, no, we're going forward, so get your client ready. So the trial starts on uh, November 19th, 1955, and guess who the star witness was? You guessed it. The arrow, dependable, lovable Harry Huggins here. So anyway, by the way, the uh, district attorney for the uh, Tarrant County was Howard Fender. Also representing the state is a Prosecutor Herbert Wade and uh, Dawson Davis. The attorneys representing Mary Clark were Arthur Moore, Jess Martin, and Elvin Tackett. And of course, the first person to take the stand, of course, was Harry Huggins. And of course, District Attorney Fender uh, uh, questioned Mr. Huggins about his uh, role in the murder, about uh, Mrs. Clark. And of course, Huggins stated that uh, Eagleston, approached him, Terry Eastman approached Huggins there, saying that a woman, Mary Clark, wanted to arrange a hit of her husband, and they were going to give him uh, $10,000 for the hit. And that, of course, Cecil Green was part of the conspiracy. He also claimed that he got a pencil sketch, Eagleston got a pencil sketch of the house from Mary Clark. So they decided to, on uh, 1953, May 18th, they decided to go to the uh, Clark house between, eight, I think it was 8 and 10 p.m., to try to get into the house to, you know, take care of Mr. Clark. Well, they did not succeed getting into the house, so they thought, let's try another way. Let's try a ruse to get in the house. So the next day, they go to the house. Harry Huggins rings the doorbell. Mr. Clark shows up. Mr. Huggins says, I have a message for you. And uh, now... Tensi and Green were on the side of the house, and they said, this is the perfect time to rush him. So they rushed Mr. Clark. Uh, I think Eagleson knocks the cigar out of Clark's mouth. Uh, they, uh, they, take, they grab Mr. Clark, and uh, they take Mr. Clark up to the upstairs, to the bedroom. Of course, they're rifling through his pockets and everything. Of course, they take his money and his diamond rings and everything. And uh, they were looking around for a safe, they, and they didn't find one. Then uh, Huggins and Green decided to leave the bedroom. And as soon as they left the bedroom, they heard a gunshot. They go back to the bedroom, and, it look, and it, according to Huggins, Tensi just shot Mr. Clark. So Mr. Eagleson says, let's get out of here. So they do. They leave. They get into the car. The car would not start. <laughs> uh, they try pushing the thing. 
and uh, they didn't have any luck with it. It still wouldn't go. I think it crashed into a fence. So they decided, well, let's take Mr. Clark's car. So I think it was Huggins that goes into the house to look for the keys. He founds the keys. They get into the car. Guess what? The car, that car didn't start either. So, so this is working on a dime, isn't it? So anyway, they managed to get the car started, and they take off. Uh, of course, then they dump, the, uh, they dump the rifle under a bridge on the Trinity River and also burned his wallet. So now, the next day, uh, Huggins says that he and Eagleston, they went to a place called the Red Rooster, which was located at Northeast 28th Street. And according to Huggins, he sees Eagleston uh, talk to a guy there. He didn't recognize this guy. Eagleston's talked to a guy there about, the, of course, the payout. And uh, Mr. Eagleston returns, and he says that Mary Clark was not paying anything because he didn't hear anything about the murder. So a little bit later, they meet again at the Red Rooster. This time, Eagleston, uh, Huggins claimed that he saw Eagleston at the Red Rooster, a guy that he never, didn't recognize, and Mary Clark there. This time, she paid out. $10,000. So, and they split the of course, money three ways. Now, the, the defense gets its turn on, of course, on, on Harry Huggins here, and they wasted no time on trying to undercut his credibility here. Uh, now, according to the Star uh, Telegram, uh, the attorney for Mrs. Clark, uh, Arthur Moore, asked him if uh, he was under influence of narcotics, under, under influence of drugs. He says, no, I'm not, no. Have you ever used narcotics, the attorney said. I don't use narcotics. Now, remember, that contradicts his statement to Price Daniel when he said he admitted that, yeah, I did. I used morphine and cocaine. So that cut his credibility there a little bit. Now the state comes back. And this time they had testimony from William Clark himself because they had papers from the annulment suit that, of course, William Clark filed against his wife, Mary Clark, and this happened 10 days before his death. And the state presented all this documentary evidence, of course, under, uh, despite the strange objections from Mary Clark's attorneys, and on the papers, uh, William Clark accused Mary Clark, of course, of uh, being unfaithful to him. He also charged that his wife had a common-law husband uh, with some other guy in New York. In fact, according to him, she was hanging around uh, this guy in New York at the same time he was looking for uh, uh, wedding rings. So, so now, she also claimed, he also claimed that she got a pair of silk pajamas from this guy. So that was kind of suspicious. Now on the November 21st, 1955, a surprise witness for the state shows up. This is Vanita Taylor. She was a lingerie buyer for Cox Department Store. And she testified that she saw Mrs. Clark and Tinsy Eagleston in her store in 1954. Now, she didn't think much of the incident at that time, but when the trial started and she saw the stuff in the paper, she says, hey, yeah, I think I remember seeing uh, these two people, Mrs. Clark and uh, Eagleston, at uh, my store, Cox Department store. Well, and there's Eagleston right there. Well, this guy uh, pops up. This is uh, F.L. Uh, F. Carlson here. F.L. Carlson uh, worked at a bank, and he testified that, no, the person that you saw there wasn't, uh, wasn't him. It was me. So, and the reason why there's some confusion, because you've noticed these two guys, they wear almost similar hats, and if you notice, they wear the their brims of the hats turned upward like that. Well, he says, well, no, the person that you saw wasn't him. That was me you saw at the store. And uh, he claimed that he hung around uh, Mrs. Clark, you know, a few times. Uh, he went to a bank picnic at one time, and they said they were probably hanging around downtown Fort Worth and probably hanging around that store. And that, that's what he testified at the trial there. So he says that uh, Vanita Taylor was just uh, was, was mistaken. Now, the next day, another witness shows up, and his name was Julius Lineri. He was a stockbroker and the supposed love interest of Mary Clark. He was subpoenaed by the state. He was going to be the big witness for them because he was going to prove that there was something going on between Mary Clark and Mr. Lanieri. And uh, 
that there was some kind of intimate relationship going on. In fact, uh, the Clark estate claimed that Mary Clark actually spent 10 days with Mr. Lanieri. Uh, you know, in New York, of course, at the same time, Mr. Clark was looking for wedding rings. But Mr. Lanieri didn't exactly help the state's case because on the stand, he says he was never intimate with Mrs. Clark. He said there was nothing going on. He says, first of all, I've never been able, could not have been physically intimate with her because I've been uh, suffering from tuberculosis for 10 years. So there's no way anything could have gone, gone wrong. I mean, gone on between uh, us two. Now, there were 25 love letters, actually, that exchanged between these two people, Lanieri and Mary Clark. And now, Mr. Uh, Lanieri ins insisted that, yeah, there were love letters, but all this infatuation stuff, that was all Mrs. Clark's idea, and that uh, he did not encourage it. He met it any day to her for, uh, I think, about a few weeks in 1953, uh, right after the annulment suit was filed, but he says, no, but there was no intimacy between us two. Now, the state brought in another witness, another supposed love interest, this time a truck driver named Duffy Slaughter. They thought that, hey, he, this guy will probably help our case, but he didn't. He says, no, there was nothing going on between me and Mrs. Clark. He said he kissed her a couple of times and held her, but that was it. Yeah. So, now, um, yeah. Now, you're probably wondering about uh, Mrs. Clark's take on this relationship between Lanieri and her. Um, she admitted that, yeah, yeah, there were some love letters between exchanges between us two, uh, but she claimed, no, I, I wasn't in, really in love with Mr. Mr. Lanieri. Uh, her explanation was that, uh, when I, somebody asked her, why, why these love letters? She says, well, I thought this was the best way of breaking off the relationship. <laughs> that was the best way out of it. I don't know, it doesn't make any sense to me, so... Anyway, now, a uh, question that everybody wants to know is, um, where was Mrs. Clark when all this was going on, by the way? Uh, you know, the murder and the supposed meeting between Mr. Eagleston and her and this other guy where supposedly this payout happened. Uh, where was her alibi? Well, on the night of the murder, May 19th, 1953, a gentleman named Bill Parham testified that he asked her, hey, you want to go to the drive-in? Yeah, sure. So guess what? They go to drive-in. They go to this place. This is the crowd drive-in on Jacksboro Highway on May 19th. So they go over there and watch the movie there. And a few days later, um, they, he asked her if you want to go to Lake Texoma. And they did. They went to Lake Texoma. Now, a witness testified that when Mrs. Clark was notified about the murder, uh, while at the lake, she testified that she was just shocked and she was just, you know, incoherent and heartbroken hearing about the murder of her husband. Now, what, now, regarding back to Huggins' story that on May 20th that there was an exchange of, of the payout money at that Red Rooster uh, involving Mr. Eagleston and uh, Mary Clark, well, it turned out several witnesses at the trial testified that Mrs. Clark was actually at a funeral the same day that the supposed payout happened. In fact, they produced a con condolence card that Mary Clark signed saying, hey, there was no way she could have been there because she was at a funeral. So that kind of blew a hole in the uh, state's case that there was supposed to be a payout at the Red Rooster. So now the defense, um, now go to the closing uh, statements by the defense and of course by the state. Now defense, of course, closed its case reminding, of course, the jurors about Mr. Huggins. He was about his unreliability. Remember, on the stand, Huggins claimed that he never took drugs but at, at the subcommittee meeting, Price Daniels says, yeah, I did take drugs. So that undercut his credibility. They admit the love letters. They said it was silly and foolish, but that did not prove that she was a, she was a murderess. Now, during uh, her, uh, Mr. Moore's uh, closing statement, uh, Mary Clark broke out crying, being absolutely hysterical to the point where the judge stopped the trial and they had to take Mary Clark out of the courtroom because she just totally lost it. So... Now, the state comes in, and they're closing, and they still contend that Marie Clark, of course, had something to do with the murder of her husband, and that her $10,000 was paid out. And uh, Mr. Fender, of course, pleaded with the jurors to send uh, Mrs. Clark to life in prison. They didn't ask for the death penalty at that time. And the reason why was that because she was a woman. So they said, just give her life. And by the way, Mary Clark did not take the stand in her own defense. So the case goes to the jury. 
Case goes to the jury on a Saturday. Three ballots were taken, and they reached a decision the next day around 2 p.m., and the verdict was not guilty. Mrs. Clark took a deep breath, rolled her eyes, and just became totally hysterical. And she landed on the shoulder of her uh, lawyer, Elvin Tackett, and had to help her out of the courtroom. And so one of the longest, uh, course, and most sensational murder trials in the city's history was over. And um, there was 150 exhibits in that trial, by the way. It was one of the largest in the, in the, in the city's history. Now, what swayed the jury to acquit Mrs. Clark? Well, one of the jurors uh, actually told the Fort Worth Press is that one of the reasons why they acquitted her was because of Harry Huggins. They just did not trust Mr. Huggins. So, and they didn't believe the story about, you know, this money has changed at the Red Rooster. They thought, well, it shows that, you know, she was at her funeral. So, anyway, now, regarding Mr. Huggins, whoops, uh, so Mr. Huggins was still looking at a murder charge, by the way, for his role in the uh, murder of uh, William Clark. He was also involved in the uh, breaking into a paint and wallpaper company in Fort Worth. So he's looking at a burglary charge and a murder charge. So he, they, uh, Mr. Huggins uh, cut a deal with the DA's office. He pled guilty to murder, and he got five years for that and also two years for the burglary. <laughs> yeah. Now, regarding the uh, settlement, do uh, you remember the annulment suit? Well, on the April 23, 1956, uh, Mrs. Clark reached a, um, an agreement uh, with the estate uh, on the annulment suit. Mrs. Clark gets the title for the Cadillac. She also gets the furniture in the house. Uh, and uh, they also uh, get the wedding ring and some other jewelry. But she also had the right to live in the house, by the way, the Westbrook house. But she didn't hold the title to the house. The house was held by Philip Clark, her brother. It's kind of weird. Um, in exchange, she did not want anything from the uh, Clark estate. She didn't get any money. That was it. All she got was the house, the car, and a few other things. And that was pretty much the end of it. So now what happened to these folks? Well, Mary Clark uh, did not live the rest of her life at the house, by the way. She uh, moved to Oklahoma, and she died in Guthrie on November 8, 2010, at the age of 102. So, yeah. Um, She's buried, by the way, at Callaway Cemetery, by the way. Callaway Cemetery is located uh, just north of Arlington, and uh, it's, there's a little housing development called Viridian. Have you heard about this? Yeah, Viridian Housing Complex in Arlington. There's a cemetery there, Callaway Cemetery, and uh, she's buried right there uh, next to her, I think it's her first husband right there. So, anyway, now Mr. Huggins, now you would think that his life and crime would be over, that maybe returning you leave? No, forget it. <laughs> No, because um, on January, uh, because he was caught uh, burglarizing a, a state welfare office. Yeah, uh, this is in 1967. He was in there. He was in some. I think it was a janitor that caught him in there. I think he caught him in the men's room stall there, trying to uh, take some stuff out of the state uh, office there. He was also accused of another robbery. Now, in that robbery, I think it was a robbery that happened in a store in Jacksboro Highway, he goes in there wearing a Halloween mask, and the people there thought this was a joke. And, uh, well, to prove to them that it was not a joke, he takes off his Halloween mask. <laughs> so, he's not the sharpest knife in the drawer, let's put it this way. Okay, so. So, anyway, I think the DA's office determined this guy's bad news, so guess what? You're getting life in prison. So, they did. So, they, they sent him to the slammer for the rest of his life. But guess what? He got paroled. <laughs> he got paroled in, um, two, in 1982. And he actually died in, in, uh, here in Tarrant County in 1990. And finally, oh, that's, uh, oh yeah, that's Walterine. This is uh, Tinsley Eagleston's wife, Walterine, by the way, Eagleston here. Uh, she, uh, she's buried in Cleburne next to her husband. By the way, uh, his wife tried to kill herself. I think this happened a couple of years after the murder. She tried to kill herself. Apparently all the drama about the trial just was too much for her, and she tried to take her own life. So they should, she didn't succeed. So anyway, as for the Westbrook house, well, uh, the house kind of uh, went through a period uh, where it, uh, it went, exchanged hands a few times, and it went through a period where it was not very kept, well kept. But then many years ago, it was bought, it was renovated, and as you can see, it's absolutely beautiful. If you've ever driven by there, 
you ought to go check it out. It's actually a beautiful house. And uh, it's been declared a state landmark, by the way. And actually, in the 2009, it was put on the National Register of Historic Places, by the way, because, of course, of its historical and architectural value, because, like I said, it was, it was designed by Joseph Peelick. He was, a, like I said, a very famous architect here. It's the only house probably in that street that has the historical marker on the front yard there. You can't miss it. It's a, it's a huge historical marker there. And it's actually one of two houses there with a historical marker. There's another one there also. So anyway, so now the question is, is that do you think the jury got it right in this case? Now, if you want my opinion, yeah, I think they did. Because Harry Huggins, I just don't, didn't trust Mr. Huggins there. I just don't think he was a very liable witness there. I think it's, it's safe to say that uh, Mary Clark was not interested in Mr. Clark. <laughs> because he let him. Uh, she was seeing dollar signs in her eyes when she met Mr. Clark. I think that's, that's a given, and that she was, you know, hanging around other people when this was going on. So, anyway. And the end. <laughs> uh,